So, Sunday evening. Sunday evening before this podcast is coming out on Monday. And you can hear the bath running. I have been at Fertility Fest all weekend and just got back to Manchester and thought I'd give you a real up-to-date intro. So welcome. Welcome to the Fertility Podcast. I'm Natalie Silverman, if this is your first listen. Maybe you've been at Fertility Fest and have seen me this weekend. I mean, that'd be cool if you remembered that there's a Fertility Podcast to go and check out. So I am going to be sharing an episode about mental health, uh, which isn't from Fertility Fest. I'm going to be sharing my content, some of the content from the fest next Monday. And keep watching my socials at Fertility Poddy on Twitter and Insta and the Fertility Podcast Facebook page um, because I'm I'm putting other stuff from Fertility Fest just around. But I'm not going to lie, I left Fertility Fest on Saturday yesterday and went to see an old school friend of mine, Joe, who I've not seen for a year. I got very drunk last night and I felt absolutely awful today. And I've had to drive back to Manchester from London. So I wasn't not I wasn't gonna do this intro till tomorrow morning, but I've come up with an idea that I want to share with you. So there's amazing things happening within the fertility community with the likes of Fertility Fest, with what we share on social and um how we're sharing each other's stories and I'm launching, as of today, a new little feature in my podcast called A Day in Your Life and what I'm interested in seeing is if you fancy recording a snippet of your day into your phone and emailing it to me and then I will play it out on a fertility podcast. So if you will, if you fancy that, then just email natalie at the fertilitypodcast.com no longer than five minutes, one to five minutes. Um, it might not be easy to email if it's too big. Right. I'm running through this bath whilst trying to record this podcast intro. I'm literally giving you a snippet of my life. And um, I'm talking to my recorder because I'm making the beginning of my podcast. People that listen to the Fertility Podcast, you know Mummy makes a podcast? Yeah, but who did you talk to? To the people that listen to the podcast. Who are listening to the podcast. Well, men and women who want to understand about their fertility. But what do the men and women say? What? Oh, I forgot to pause <laughs> that funny thing. Got that one. Right, I've come up with a better plan. I've come up with a better plan for sharing any audio that you might make on your phone. Let's try one to two minutes a day in your life an email to Natalie at the Facility Podcast.com. And if they are too big to send or too big for me to receive, then I'll set up a little Dropbox or a different way of us doing this. Because I think it'd be lovely to hear your voices so if you're up for it go for it email me and we'll see what happens the facility podcast is starting a new phase it's going to be published somewhere else that i will be telling you about next week it's still going to be on this feed but um there's some new elements coming to the facility podcast which will only make it easier for more people to hear which is really exciting so i'll tell you more about that before we have today's episode we're going to hear from my brilliant sponsors and I'd be interested to know whether you are enjoying the messages that I'm sharing from my sponsors because I want them to be useful. So if you're not, tell me. If you are, great. If you're not, if, if when you hear these messages you switch off, I'd like to know because I want to be sharing messages from people who are working with me to help me keep making this podcast but providing services for you that are helpful. So have a listen and if you're not enjoying it, let me know. That's it, thefertilitypodcast.com. Then we'll hear from my guest, Natasha Devon, whose details will all be at the show notes at the end. So make sure you listen to the end. You'll know that I talk a lot about support on this podcast, and that's why I'm really chuffed to be working with one of my sponsors, Apricity. They offer extra fertility benefits at no extra cost. And when you start your treatment with Apricity, you'll benefit from support and guidance seven days a week with your very own Apricity advisor. Plus, there's an app to keep you in the know every step of your fertility journey. And you know what? You pay the same as you would at a clinic. Find out more at apricity.life forward slash podcast. Another of my sponsors 
is International Andrology, who specialise in diagnosing and treating male infertility. Around 50% of infertility issues are male factor, and all too often, men aren't even evaluated at the start of a fertility journey, which might result in unnecessary treatments, costs and disappointment. International Andrology is one of the few specialist clinics in the UK offering a holistic approach to increase your chances to conceive naturally or via the IVF route. As well as treating the underlying causes of male infertility, their doctors have some of the highest success rates in microsurgical sperm retrieval. So, if you're looking for a true specialist to assist you on your fertility journey, visit london-andrology.co.uk today and do mention the Fertility Podcast. So I'm delighted to welcome Natasha Devon. MBE, who is a writer and activist and tours schools and colleges around the UK uh, doing talks and she's done a whole host of research on mental health, on body image, gender and social equality to the podcast. A slightly unusual guest, but you will understand why I have invited Natasha on. So welcome, Natasha. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you for having me. Well, I know it's a, a busy time for you because you're involved in so many different campaigns. We're speaking on a day that I think you've been talking about safer internet practice, haven't you? That's right. Yeah. Well, what I've been saying is that the Social media in particular is so often demonized as this kind of bogeyman that's single handedly responsible for growing levels of poor mental health in young people. Whereas, in fact, there are a few things which are exacerbated by the Internet, like grooming and bullying, which specifically need to be looked at. But like everything, social media can either be positive or negative. It depends on the content and how you're using it. So I'm trying to kind of focus people's attention on specific areas because I think there's been this massive moral panic mm. about, about the internet which isn't necessarily helpful for progress. Well I completely agree with you and especially when we talk about people who are trying to conceive because there's an amazing support community on certain social media platforms and I speak to a lot of people who talk about how much help they have had um, so it's good that we are trying to get that that accurate message across of, of the pros and the cons because yeah, we don't need the scaremongering do we? It, exactly and I think what infertility and mental health issues have in common is that they can both be really isolating experiences. So if you're able to access people who have gone through something similar online, it, it helps you to have that sense of, of belonging and being understood, which are really key human psychological needs. Yeah. Now, I'd found out about you through my other job as a radio presenter, because one of your current projects is with the Mental Health Media Charter and a campaign called Where's Your Head At?, which is hoping to change the law to protect the mental health of British workers. And again, I thought this was really relevant to my audience. So just explain to me more about the Where's Your Head At campaign. So the, the idea from my point of view came about because I find that today's teenagers, and you know, I work predominantly with 14 to 18 year olds, are incredibly emotionally literate. And whilst they might not have the support in place, they do know what's going on with them and they're generally able to articulate that quite well. So I was finding, I was going into schools and, and what I was having to do was to catch up their parents to where they were. And I thought this is strange because there's this real generational divide in understanding uh, in terms of mental health that this generation have just grown up with completely different parameters mm. and I think that's because there's been a, a drive in education over the past decade to, to educate them better and that's obviously worked which is brilliant but then I thought well you know in a school I've got a captive audience they have to be there it's assembly you know yeah. <laughs> whereas with parents it's always voluntary and you know the parents that turn up are always the ones who by definition need it least so I was thinking you know where are the adults and I thought oh they're, they're at work a lot of them so that's when I thought well how do we access adults at work and um, I am a, an instructor for an organization called Mental Health First Aid England and that means that I am qualified to train people in how to become a mental health first aider and uh, around that time I met up with um, Lucy Cave at, at Bauer who's director of brands and she said, you know, Bauer are really keen to do something really impactful on mental health. You know, we've got all of these different brands that talk to all of these different audiences. What one change could we make? And so we came up with this idea to try and introduce parity between physical and mental health when it comes to first aid. And what that means is if you have a medical first aider at work, 
which most people do, mm. you should also have a mental health first aider. <laughs> so that's what the campaign seeks to do. It seems to enshrine in law the obligation for employers to have mental health first aiders. And people can train to become this. It's obviously a couple of days course that you go and you learn. It's something that I've actually signed up to do because I thought it was a brilliant idea. And whilst I'm not in the same workplace all the time, I felt quite strongly that I was in a position where if I could offer some kind of signposting to people, because I think that's part of it, isn't it, is if you are struggling knowing that there's somebody who's maybe not an official person, but somebody who you felt you could go and speak to about what it is you're going through. Well, it, it teaches you as well as the, the mental health first aider what to say and what not to say to somebody. So if you have a colleague, for example, who's exhibiting symptoms of depression, it teaches you how to approach them. Um, you know, you're not there to diagnose. Uh, you're not there to fulfill the role of a medical professional in any way. Mm. You're just there to have a non-judgmental, compassionate chat. And the evidence shows that if the first person that you talk to about your mental health has that kind of compassionate response, you'll probably get better quicker because it will affect your, your recovery pathway. And, you know, my sense is that there's a lot of people out there who they suspect that something's going on with someone at work. But because mental illness is, there's so much stigma and it's so shrouded in this kind of conspiracy of silence and it's invisible, we don't know the protocol. And when someone's physically ill, totally. we, know, we know the drill, don't we? Send them a text, buy them grapes. Don't know why grapes, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what you do. Yeah. yeah. So it's just the mental health equivalent. You know, it's putting those protocols in place. And it, it feels empowering to be able to have access to this type of information. When I was filling in the form, actually, um, to, to become one of the first aiders, and I'd explained that I kind of work in a virtual way in different, I'm working in and out of different groups of people. Um, the lady that I was talking to, she was saying, you know, brilliant. And I, I think it, it, it's, it's good to maybe say to people as well that if, like me, you're not necessarily working in a conventional workplace, it's still something that you could look to do. Yeah, so there's two ways to train. Um, the, the mental health first aid course, that I do is the two day course. There's there's also a half a day and, and, a, and a one day course, but the most kind of in depth is two days and it's for between eight and 16 people. So you can either invite a mental health first aid instructor into your workplace for between eight and 16 members of staff if you work in a larger environment and a larger business, or you can contact mental health first aid and say what courses are going on in my area and join a, a, a random one, which I actually think uh, as an instructor is a better way to do it because w whenever I go into a business, there's a pre-existing dynamic and you can always tell like someone's annoyed with someone and uh, you know, I've had a couple of situations where there's secret affairs and all that kind of stuff wow. and, and okay. you're, you're talking about kind of really hefty emotional yeah. stuff. Uh, so I, I would advise going on a course where you don't know anyone in the room because you've got a kind of a clean slate when you start. Well, I'll put all the details in the show notes for this episode and I'm going to be feeding back when I've done mine so I'll be able to talk more about it. And I also want to talk with you about the work you do for no panic which is another organization you are a patron of for people struggling with anxiety because last year I actually spoke up about my own anxiety to a few of my friends I went and sought out some some help I had a, a few kind of counseling sessions about it and I was quite surprised that when I spoke to a few of my close friends we were all kind of going through quite similar things and none of us were really getting any support or talking about it and I wanted to see what you thought in that are we guilty of playing down anxiety still? Well, I think the problem with anxiety is that it's an emotion that every single person experiences. And it's actually a very useful emotion, or it certainly was throughout human history. It's designed to protect you from predators and dangerous situations. Mm. It's, it's there to alert you that something's not quite right. The problem is, is people can't often tell when they've tipped over from common or garden anxiety into something that is more debilitating and, and more of a problem in terms of their functioning. Um, and so I, I would say that the solution is almost always to nip it in the bud. And the problem with that is we, we live in a culture where we're encouraged to distance ourselves from our emotions because life is very hectic and noisy and fraught and busy. And, and so just to give you one example, I read somewhere that your average commuter, if they get on the tube at rush hour, experiences the same levels of stress as a World War II fighter pilot. Whoa. But, 
you obviously can't allow yourself to feel that because, you know, you wouldn't make it to work. So we distance ourselves from that feeling. And that means that we're not in tune with There's part of our brain called the amygdala, which sends out these signals. It's a very basic bit of hardware. It doesn't know you're on the tube. It just knows that it doesn't feel nice. And we're blocking those signals, which means that the amygdala thinks it's being ignored and it sends out even more adrenaline, even more panic. And that's where it can build up and build up and build up to a point where it becomes unmanageable. So one of the things that I'm doing in schools, working with young people is saying that it's okay to feel anxious. You don't have to deny the feeling. But what we do need are coping strategies for that. Um, And again, with Mental Health First Aid England, they recommend that every person takes they say an hour a day, which I think is a bit realistic. So I ask people to to aim for half an hour a day to empty their stress buckets, to release that adrenaline and cortisol from their system and restore their chemical balance. And that is your mental fitness, I guess. Because I know you talk about how we all have a brain, so we all have a mental health and we should all, like you've just described, be taking care of it in the same way that we address looking after ourselves from a dietary or a a physical exercising way. I know definitely that it's not something that I've really thought about enough until more recently. So for people who are in this space struggling to conceive and they are managing an emotional roller coaster for for most people it will be definitely a monthly bout of anxiety when you you find you're not pregnant again or if you've sadly gone through actual fertility treatment and and that's not worked then there's all that emotional toll that goes with that not not including what happens during the procedure itself you know processes and there's waiting and and there's all these ups and downs and there's a lot of conversations that happen in this space about the emotional roller coaster of it. What kind of advice would you give to people? I know that you're not a, a, an expert in infertility, but I, but just from the kind of conversations that you have with people, because it has been proven that there is a significant link between infertility and mental health. And we do need to talk more openly about it. I agree. And actually, as part of my book, I interviewed some experts in hormones. And it's very difficult to get, in particular, the National Health Service to admit that there is a really strong link between your hormones and your mental health. But a lot of people who are um, you know, specifically researchers in that area, and there are a very small number of people, will tell you that if you have a hormonal imbalance, that it will bring on symptoms which are very similar to anxiety, for example. So if you are having some kind of fertility treatment, I think the first thing to bear in mind is that it will inevitably have an impact on your mental health, quite aside from all the worries around whether or not you will conceive, that there's something happening to you actually physiologically, which which is likely to induce feelings of anxiety and to put a kind of safety net in place for yourself at those times. Um, I would recommend doing the hour of self-care. The self-care, it can be physical activity, relaxation or creativity. So anything you do for that hour should fulfill one of those three things. And the other advantage, I think, to taking your hour a day to do those things is that it gives you an identity outside of being a prospective parent um mm. it, you know it's it's it reminds you that as much as this is something that you're really hoping is going to happen, you do have other things going on. And, you know, even though I've I've not experienced infertility myself, I have had that experience of really wanting something to happen and being so focused on that, that I I have forgotten to remember everything else that's going on in my life. And um, yeah, so I, I would recommend noting the times in your cycle when you're likely to be hormonally imbalanced, and then making sure that you ring fence time for your self care, particularly and, and really prioritize it during those times such practical steps but it's so true because so many of us put stuff on hold waiting for the outcome that we so desire and forgetting like you say that there is other things going on in in life that uh, you can hopefully look forward to and talking more about your book which again I'll put the links to in the show notes which is a beginner's guide to being mental an a to z um the reviews are brilliant people talking about how you've really managed to inject humor into the subject 
because I, I do think that there's this perception that it's all doom and gloom when we talk about mental health. And so we shy away from it. Tell me a bit more about what people can expect from the book. Well, I find that humour is a really good way to break down barriers when you're talking about really taboo subjects. It's a way of kind of penetrating that subject in a way that is, I guess, less awkward. So that's what I do with teenagers. Some people say that my assembly is, or is like an hour of watching stand-up comedy. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of learned my craft from stand-up comics. That when I was growing up, I was a massive fan of Eddie Izzard. That's like literally all I used to imbibe. And um, so I, I have that uh, kind of comic timing. And um, the, the class is basically divided up into three sections. So the first is um, a little bit about my own experience of mental illness. Um, the second is the scientific bit, how your brain works, what's going on in your body. And then the third bit is practical tips for how to navigate life. You know, so how does this apply to you? And I found that that was a formula that worked really well in my talk. So what I did with the book is I did it in an A to Z format. We've got 26 letters, all of which you could write a book in, you know, on every single topic mm. of those of those 26 could be a book in its own right. But I took each topic and divided it up into that those three sections, applied that same formula. Here's a little bit of my experience. Here's the science. Here's how it relates to you. And you mentioned your own experience. Do you find that it's a constant, not work in progress, but you, you have to constantly work at your mental health? It's not just fixed. That was the biggest lesson I had to learn, actually, because particularly, I think, in media, stories of mental illness are presented in very binary terms. Mm. It, this person was really ill and da da now they're better and they yeah. live happily ever after. And it's a bit like weight loss stories. You always read about the person that, that lost half their body weight, but nobody ever checks on them, you know, in a year, in four years' time, have they managed to, to keep that weight off? And I suspect the answer is no, because mm. those kinds of rapid transformations are not usually sustainable. So what I've learned is that for me, recovery is an ongoing process. And whilst I, I would say I, I manage fairly well, you know, I used to have a couple of panic attacks a day at my worst. I now have maybe two a year. But that's as a result of overhauling my lifestyle, finding the right medication, finding a therapist that I trust, um, knowing what my triggers are, taking swift actions when I feel those those triggers coming to the fore. There were a lot of things I had to learn in order to, to get to that point. And I'm reconciled now to the idea that it will, I'll have a dip in my mental health at some point in the future, and that's okay. It doesn't mean that I've relapsed just means I'm having a moment but you have the tools to cope yes exactly because I think that that again is really relevant to anybody who is is dealing with the infertility in that there is this drop-off of support if you stop having treatment or if you stop I've had some conversation in my closed Facebook group about being told to stop trying to get on with your life and you never you know if you if you're wanting a family you never really stop trying never goes away and one of the things that I think um, is really important to highlight is that there are all these different kind of peaks and troughs of it like you've just described and even like I shared an episode at the end of last year we're lucky we've got a beautiful little boy who's four but we're still in this place of wondering about what our family looks like still and dealing with the the um we have frozen embryos and I'd talked about our decision as to whether we try and extend our family or whether and whether the pressures of treatment is something that we could manage and all, all these other things that you have to consider and it's something that I wanted to convey and people I think were quite happy to to have that conversation open that this is an ongoing thing even when you've hopefully had success in having a having a family or starting your family um it, it, it it's kind of quite deep rooted when you've been through something that you a didn't expect and, and something that you you never really knew could happen to you which I think mental health is in the same box we talk about it much more now but growing up it was never something really that you thought would happen to you I suppose it's an experience that you're living every day and um it's do you know what it reminds me of is um if somebody if you have a person of color in the public eye what you'll find is that they very often refer to their race. And, and it seems obvious to us because 
if you are a white person, you are referring to your race all the time, but it's invisible to us because we've had it for so long that we've forgotten to notice. So you'll have people say to them, oh, do you just go on about race all the time. And it's because that, that they don't have the option to opt out of mm. that. Uh, they're living it every single day. That's, that's their life. And it's the same for um, a mental health issue. I don't have the option to open the door in my head and take out my brain and swap it for another one. <laughs> that that is um, completely mentally healthy. I don't have the option to opt out of of mental ill health. Yeah. Um, so therefore, it, you know, if people say to me, oh, it every and it is, you know, I am that person at a party that you know people are literally queuing up to to tell me their life story, and I'm relating everything somehow <laughs> to mental well being. But that's that's because of my experience, and uh, you know, ultimately, I I don't think that I would swap it. Yeah, you've said that so much more eloquently than I did. And that's exactly what I was trying to convey when it comes to infertility, because you don't sadly have an option to opt out. And so you manage it. It's a part of who you are and who you've become. And it's getting those tools, which you've brilliantly described, that you're making, hopefully, people more aware of how, where they can go, what they can read. And I think it's it's really incredible work. And it's been really lovely talking to you about it. Thank you. I, the, the other thing that I just wanted to say before we end is sure. that what I do have experience of is being a 37 year old childless woman. I've made the decision with my partner. We don't want children. That's not because I don't love children. Um, I've got a lot of children in my family. I, they're a joy. They're a delight. I, but I just ultimately I'm, I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission to save the nation's mental health. And I can't do that and devote time to to being a mum as well. So that was a decision that we made. But it occurs to me the amount of times, you know, I've been married now for three years, the amount of times in an average week when I am asked, so wh when are you going to have babies then? Mm. And I always think, whenever it happens, I always think, what if I couldn't? And I just think that people need to be more mindful of, uh, you know, not not everybody is following this prescribed pathway. And, and for me, it's just annoying. But if I really wanted children and I couldn't have them... It, it, that would be devastating every time I, I was asked. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm on a bit of a, a thing about drawing people up on that now. Well, it's something that I've talked about in this podcast. Childless by choice and childless not by choice is, um, is a, it's like you said, it's a huge discussion that needs to be had. And the fact that you told me what you just told me and kind of justified it, it, it even even the way that you presented it was kind of society's fault because you had to give me the reason why you've chosen to not have children, whereas you shouldn't really have to. Um, but you're, you're completely right. And we do have to work on what questions we ask and, and knowing that it's actually none of our business and we shouldn't judge anybody by whether they have children or not because like you say I mean I sadly know people who are childless not by choice and have had to say quite harshly to people when they've been asked on a regular basis the blunt truth of their infertility struggles to shut people up which it shouldn't be that either. Yeah absolutely and I wonder whether there is some kind of pithy thing that I can come up with in response maybe even a humorous thing I might start saying to people how much sex are you having with your partner yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or something just to show how invasive a question and how inappropriate a question that is yeah well keep me posted because we'll happily <laughs> share it whatever it is okay. you come up with Natasha thank you so much for your time it's been really lovely you're welcome thanks for having me the show notes this episode are thefertilitypodcast.com forward slash Natasha Devon and I will put in the show notes a reminder of how to send me your audio, okay? Also going to put in there a little reminder of the British Podcast Awards Listener's Choice Award, which is open to the 18th of May, if you fancy giving me a little vote. And I guess I could ask you to try and subscribe to this podcast and rate and review it, because I have been asking you and you have been doing it. It's lovely. It's lovely hearing what you think and, and I suppose showing other people what you think rather than just the messages I get sent. Bit of homework from today's podcast episode. Um, get recording some audio if you fancy it. If you've got a smartphone, you should probably have a voice recorder app. You definitely do on an iPhone. I think a voice note, and then I think you can send it me. An ideal would be if I can get messages from a WhatsApp group. If I can do that, I'll set it up and I will talk about it on another podcast episode. This is what's going on in my bar room. Do you want to say cheerio? Do you want to say cheerio to the podcast listeners? I'm going to say, until the next time, because that's what I say at the end, until the next time, I say thank you for your support, and thank you for 
letting me tell stories, by supporting and listening. And until the next time. Do you want to say until the next time? No. Cheerio then. I do. Go on then. No, don't squirt that bit. Until the next time. Go. Until the next time. Until the next time. Cheers.